Atheist Nomads episode 296. What's it like to be an atheist in Idaho? The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me is Lauren. Hello. We have Rocco with us. Of course. And we have Gary. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kylie. Hi, Gary. Kylie <laughs> is around, but she is trying to. She's and standing up and being adorable. She's impressing Gary with her couch climbing skills. Couch gymnastics. So how have you been, Gary? It's been uh, a while. Yeah, it's been a bit. I've been doing pretty well. You know, not too bad. I'm uh, completely ready for this nice weather we're having. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been, yeah. That, that winter was long and tedious and... Wet and... Fuck February, right? Mm. Like, the number of days we had what was 28 in the morning and 35 in the afternoon... It was just too many. It was, yeah, it was boring. Because yeah. it was all like 40 to 30 or 40 mile an hour winds. Yep. Oh, man. And now it's... And yeah. it was a super mild winter, you guys. So yes. It's like... But windy. Always windy. 35 and windy sucks. Yes, it does. <laughs> Especially when you have to go outside at work to vape and there's parking <laughs> lots everywhere and nothing to cut the wind. Oh, Ew, oh. smoke break problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to my car on that one. I ended up doing quite a bit of that. Yeah, then you got to clean your windshield. Yeah, the windows off all the time. I just think of the uh, IT crowd episode where she has to get <laughs> paint game pushed further and further off campus until they're in like Soviet Russia. Yeah, that one's pretty funny. All right, so we were going to have an interview today, and I, I got started with the interview, and then you know he's he's talking about what he's doing, and so far it was all sounding good. Until the what he's coaching people out of religion to, and that is altered states of consciousness. And I was like, um, wait, what? Is that LSD? Like you're helping people get high on their own? He's like, no, for some people it's more real than reality. What? And, and like I let him talk a bit more after that, and then I stopped him, and I was like, um, okay, so we need to go back and talk about this. What the hell? And then he asked me the question, when was the last time you astral traveled? At which point I said, I'm going to stop wasting your time. We're done. <laughs> but Dustin, Dustin, seriously, when was the last time you experienced an out-of-body experience? Never. Never. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Gary, throwing that over to you? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much never. Pretty much never? Yeah. Okay. So that's a never all around. Yep. So anyway, we're... Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're doing a normal episode now. That was fun throwing that together at the last minute. Um, but thank you, Gary, for stepping up. Absolutely, yeah. I'm glad to be here. Stepping and, over. And I just realized I did lie about that. Out of body experience, I got the chicken pox when I was 16. I saw all oh, kinds of crazy late. shit. Yeah, it was, it was messed up. Oh, damn. Yeah, that was like the, probably the weirdest, wildest brain thing I've ever had going. Uh, Jimmy in the, the chat said, Dustin... When was the last time you saw past the barriers of reality and saw the truth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, last time for that would have been uh, when God told me to reject an Air Force ROTC scholarship and go deep into debt studying theology. <laughs> Thanks for that, Such God. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. He, he didn't mention the debt, but that was kind of implied. Well, he's not a very good financial planner because he's always begging for money. Right, I know. Um, but we do have coming up episode 300. It is scheduled for a five-hour live recording April 20. Uh, 420, yes, we've made that joke. Yep. There is Hi, a chance that that will be rescheduled, um, but I will edit this if that happens. Okay. So if you are hearing that date, it is it is still a go for April 20. Um but don't wait on sending us your questions, that you, things you want us to talk about during the recording, any well wishes you have, any congratulations. Voicemails. Email it to contactatheistnomads.com or leave it a voice message using SpeakPipe. You can also call 541-203-0666, but SpeakPipe's better. If that's the case, then why don't you just drop the phone number? I might. All right. I just haven't. Because it's free? Basically. It's free and it never gets used. <laughs> well, that's the perfect perfect thing yeah. for it then, huh? Yep. 
And uh, we did get some feedback that I, I do want to cover right off the bat because it is a correction. Uh, this is from Lee via email. I love your podcast, but you have to be intellectually honest. The shooter in New Zealand was not inspired by Trump, much as I hate the guy. I've read the guy's manifesto, and he actually regards Trump as a political idiot. Hate Trump by all means, but you can't blame this on him or his presidency. If you do, you just feed the well of hatred, which feeds the horrible circle of hatred. You may as well, or you may well feel that the Trump presidency had something to do with the awful shooting in New Zealand, but think if it's causation by Trump or a reaction to the current environment, which made Trump president. Uh, love you guys. Lee S. in Sweden. Uh, yeah, I was wrong. I did not read the manifesto myself. I, I haven't read the manifesto. Didn't bother. Yeah. News reports from the ones I, I read, half of them said inspired by Trump, and I'd forgotten the one that said that in the manifesto, he said that he thinks Trump is an idiot. I, I think that we're, yeah, it's really easy to confuse um, the modern perception of uh, general hatred towards others as being a Trump thing. It's more yeah. a Trump era. It's more part of the era that we're in, not well, him in particular, because he is an idiot, and I don't think he does anything he, he does. The shooter was inspired by the alt-right, and the alt-right has been emboldened by, and to some extent, inspired by Trump. So, indirectly, and this is actually part it would have been a much more fascinating conversation because Trump's influence is extending even to people who think he's an idiot. And that is horrible. Yeah. That's, that's going a little bit too far on um, his influence. Honestly, like he doesn't have any good influence. Really, no, right. I mean, there's, no. there's no good, but to be emboldened by his idiocy is not a good thing whatsoever. And the fact that it's, it's now, you know, we've, we've had this rise in, the extreme right in the U.S., um, we're seeing it across the world. The far-right parties in, in Europe are more bold than they've, they've been in a long, long... Well, they're more bold than they've been since they were actual Nazis. And it, it really sucks that it has spread as far as Australia and New Zealand because the shooter was Australian shooting up a mosque in New Zealand and... Two mosques in New Zealand. It's the whole thing is shitty. It's horrible. But at least New Zealand has been able to actually take solid action about it. Yeah. And quickly. Very quickly. So, yeah. Uh, but yes, I was wrong. And I, I am sorry for that. Yeah. To be fair, reading those manifestos is hard, uh, at least for me. Like it's, it's a, um, you know, on one side, I want to be informed. On the other, I don't want to sink into nihilism. Yeah. I. I read enough news about terrible, horrible, shitty things that I do make a point of not trying to limit how much I actually, I read the actual hate directly. Yeah. There's a line that no, truly that it's hard to cross. And I, I, I've, I've been borderline enough for the last couple of years on, on becoming cynical and I have been trying to fight it. So I, I have not read the manifesto. I will not read the manifesto. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I don't need to see that. Even after you know hearing the correction, I, I still won't go. Read yeah, it. I, I I assume he's correct, and and you know, from from the various reports I I read, uh, I when I saw this email, I pretty quickly remembered the one that that specified that he hates Trump, and I was like, okay, so even, or, or at least thinks Trump is is an idiot. Um, so yeah, um, but let's, but let's go ahead and uh, get into some news. Uh, last month, a general conference session for the United Methodist Church voted by a 6% margin. Yeah. 6% of the delegates more voted in favor of the traditional plan than the one church plan. And the one church plan would have allowed local jurisdictions to determine their own policies for LGBT members, clergy, and weddings. The traditional plan does not change the church's doctrine that uh, sex is only allowed within marriage and marriage can only between, be between one man and one woman. And it goes a little bit further, creating punishments for violations of this doctrine. 
So now we're the, at the point, several weeks later, almost a month later, that openly gay pastors and bishops are trying to figure out where they fit in, in their church. There are parts of the traditional plan that have been ruled unconstitutional by the church's judicial council. Some parts of the church, such as the U.S.'s Western jurisdiction and Germany's jurisdiction, are going to be adopting the one church plan anyway. And we've e we even saw a one church, or saw one church on a reader board at the Methodist Church on Eustick here in Boise. Yeah. All means all. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was kind of wondering what that was about. I, I hadn't heard of the, the news on this until the, the podcast. Um, that makes sense. I saw the reader board. Yeah. Um, and and it's, this is one of those that is actually pretty, pretty fascinating to watch because the United Methodist Church was founded in the, I think it was 1960 or, or thereabouts, with a bunch of different Methodist churches all unifying into one, one denomination to create the United Methodist Church. That's why it's called that. And they basically took a look at all of their doctrines and they saw what, where do they all agree on things? And that's what became doctrine for the, the United Methodist Church. So for one, one good example on it, about half of the churches were opposed to alcohol consumption altogether, and the other half weren't. I'll drink to that. So as a whole, the United Methodist Church was okay with alcohol. And now what ends up happening is when a, a denomination is, is founded, it tends to get stuck especially as it spreads around the world. And they're at the point now where the U.S. only makes up a slight, major, uh, slight majority of the United Methodist Church membership. And that means that, especially in Africa, where about a third of the church's members are, uh, they've adopted what Methodism looked like when it was brought there by missionaries. Ah. That tends to be what happens with mission work. Yeah, And in the mission field, they end up being stuck there. Now, doctrine has a tendency to also be stuck at the point that it's set, so United Methodist Church doctrine has basically been stuck since the 1960s. At that point, they were one of the more liberal churches. They have shifted towards being more conservative, while at the same time, they've had a lot of members who have been moving a lot more liberal, and they have allowed that to happen until now. Where they overrode the will of the majority. Well, they they overrode the will of the majority of American church members. Not the majority of church members. Gotcha. Overall, I got you. So I got distracted by Kylie playing Mr. Thumbkin over in the corner. <laughs> she was really hidden pretty well. It was cute. So this one's going to be fascinating to see where it goes. It has some definite uh, corollaries to the Adventist church's mess over women's ordination where very similar like it's almost the exact same thing happening um except the Adventist church doesn't have a judicial council mm. they have a, a general conference executive committee that is trying to figure out how to force compliance without driving all of the money of the church away uh white people <laughs> <laughs> yep literally the worst <laughs> <laughs> no offense <laughs> we were watching an archer episode it was like, what was it white people what was it kill white people no offense kill the whiteies no offense yeah oh, kill yeah, the yeah. white people no offense yeah I love it it's like how polite <laughs> <laughs> and the, the anthropologist keeps saying yeah they're really racist and archer's response is but they're being so polite <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, that's kind of, it's a good chunk of American racism. Like, yeah, yeah you can be polite about it while being terribly offensively racist. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that's uh, the entire Southern hospitality effect. It's like, yeah, you can be an awful human being, but you're being really nice about it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Bless your heart. So, uh, <laughs> in August, on August 30, 2017, Oliver Knight, a trans man, was admitted to St. Joseph Hospital in Eureka, California. The only hospital in his area. Yeah. So it's a ways I've been there. Yeah. It's... And he was admitted for a hysterectomy. That was the last surgery he needed for his transition. 
And he found the check-in and surgery prep, quote, extremely uncomfortable and triggering. Part of why was that he was given a pink gown, and when he asked for a blue gown, he was told he needed to wear pink because it was a, quote, female surgery. Then after the IV was started, he had to wait for an hour, at the end of which the surgeon came in and said the Catholic Church denied the surgery for ethical reasons and the bishops didn't approve. Fifteen minutes later, he was kicked out of the hospital and had to wait on the curb for a friend to pick him up. Now, with the help of the ACLU, he is suing them for how he was treated. Wow, that is awful. Yeah, that is absolutely terrible treatment from pretty much anybody, let alone a hospital, like where, where care is your primary. Especially in Eureka. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What the hell? Humboldt County. Yeah, it's pretty. So most of Northern California is um, uh, progressively regressive. Um, they've got a, a bunch of things that they're actually pretty progressive on but they're still very redneck. It's a weird mix sometimes. Uh-huh. Well, um, I grew up in Southern Oregon. Okay, yeah. So similar. it's all yeah. say Jefferson. Right. Uh, it, it's a place where, lib- where where hippies and rednecks coexist, where they all agree on the same thing. Stay out of my business and get off my property. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty similar. Yeah. And as long as you keep to yourself, everybody's fine. They don't care what you're doing. Right. As long as you're leaving them alone as well. Yeah, don't step on toes. You'll be fine. Yeah. Um, which is where you can have... Which is why it shocks me that a bishop was able to shut down a surgery, because that's the opposite of that. Yeah. That's totally somebody else getting in your business. Now, I'm, I'm going to guess a bishop wasn't directly asked that it was probably one of the administrators oh, yeah. finally figured out what was happening, talked to, you know, called together their ethics committee, and they reviewed the ethical and religious directives from the U.S. Co- uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops and denied it from there because yeah. probably because that one person that one administrator was uncomfortable with it and why would a hospital care about color like seriously what uh what is because it? hospitals are obsessed with identification they they, they, they have are. to know that the person that they are talking to is the person that's on the sheet that is the person that is admitted i can kind of understand why they would do that it's very backwards and Nobody else that I know of does that. No, so it's not band. necessary, but I can see somebody justifying it as a way of saying, well, we have to know that this that this female is who we're wor- You don't want to accidentally start surgery on a male. So you... Well, it's going to be hard to do a hysterectomy on a male. So like, Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. But, but, you, but now you would, you would think that... I think one part of it could have been the fact that he has a beard... He's a muscular guy, flat chest. Um, he, you know, he's already had the mastectomies. He's been on testosterone, been working out. So wheeling it would be a, easy to confuse that wheeling a man in for a hysterectomy is something that would likely be confusing. Now you don't need to fix that confusion with a pink gown. Just tell everybody, mm. yeah, this is a trans man getting a hysterectomy. Okay. There that should resolve it. But working in that industry, I can tell you that the hospital systems are still very binary. And they oftentimes, if you're dealing with trans or um, non-binary issues, uh, errors are going to be flipped everywhere. Um, yeah. It's just, it's insane how often that comes up. Well, and, and when you look at, at medical records, something like 80% of all the records are lab results. Laboratory reference ranges are based on, are you male or female? And in some cases, in the majority of cases, it actually doesn't matter. Right. It's, if you're human, there is a normal range, Mm -hmm. but there are a surprisingly large number of test results where it actually does matter. And there is a different normal for men than there is for women. If you're a if your sex assigned birth is female and you've been on testosterone and you're a man how which set of of results or which set of reference ranges would be more accurate and that's something that doctors need to actually pay attention to but doctors don't like to actually pay attention to what the results are they like to pay attention to how they're flagged 
Right. Are they critical or not? Because yeah. if every doctor had to look at every lab result discernibly, nothing would get done. Mm-hmm. Or at least that's what they claim. Yep. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily true, <laughs> but that's what they claim. Oh, Gary, you've been sucked in. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a really good book. <laughs> <laughs> really, really good uh, rendition of You Are My Sunshine. Yeah, it was handed to me, so I feel like I'm obliged. Kind of kind of obligated. Yeah. Now, what's, that's how she gets you. And that one thing that's interesting is this was back in 2017 when Catholic hospitals did not have solid guidance to them about things like hysterectomies. Um, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has recently updated their guidance to be very specific that unless you need it or you will die, you can't have it if you are capable of reproduction. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Which means if you are a 40-year-old woman with six kids and having severe polycystic ovary issues... Nope, can't get it. Yeah, you might have have cyst rupture all the time, but doesn't matter. Yep. If you can still pop out one more. Yep. South Dakota has recently passed a law, or actually just passed a law, that will require in God We Trust signs to be posted in all public schools. What makes this one interesting is that there was a typical controversy. The House version required that these signs be posted while the Senate version permitted posting the signs. Oh, very different rules there. Yeah. So it got sent the Senate version, you know, the Senate rejected the house version. They made amendments. It went back to the house. The house added requiring putting the signs. They added that back in and they also added in the state Assuming any and all legal and financial liability for this. Oh, shit, son. Wow. That's no good. Which then made the the Senate pass uh, approve it. And it has been signed into law. Why would they approve that? Accepting liability for... Because at least that way, schools aren't being forced into doing something that's going to get them sued. No, but the government will. The government still will. At I was the... just surprised that the government would do that. <laughs> you would think, but it's like yes, we'll gladly use taxpayer money to do th- to support this. Uh, if there's anything that that what we've seen from from Republican state governments in particular in recent years is that they are more than happy to put up a fight that they are guaranteed to lose and waste as much taxpayer money as possible to make people feel uncomfortable and to restrict people's rights. Yeah, they're really good at that. Fascists. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much what it is, right? Is it it's it's fascism um knowingly losing fascism. They know they're going to lose these things. Yeah. They know the ACLU is going to come in and beat this shit down. But they made a stand. Right. Like their constituents are like, "Oh, yeah, you guys did the right thing." I don't, I still don't think their constituents really care that much. Um if they're losing money all the time. Like, yeah, they might like the idea, but in the reality of things, when what they're doing is non-feasible, I think the constituents really are not really for that. I think they're they're more cautious about money than they are about their own ideologies. Yeah. Well, and the Republican Party keeps claiming to be the party of fiscal responsibility. Yeah. And they claim that all they want. They do things like cut taxes without matching uh, spending cuts and doing f- setting up laws that are just going to result in laws that I'm going to call frivolous because defending those lawsuits is frivolous. Yeah. And it's not there. These aren't even hard wins for like the ACLU. These are pretty easy wins for the most part. They're, they're, they're pretty uh, cut and dried as far as, you know, law history goes. Uh, they've got a lot of statutes already on the books. They don't have like a, a hard uphill battle of like, this is a brand new thing. No, this is the same shit they're doing over and over <laughs> yeah. and over, losing every damn time they know they're going to. Idaho State House Resolution 6 
calls for the end of religious perse- persecution around the world. Yeah, way to go, Christians. Idaho. <laughs> for Christians. Fuck you. Yeah, Kylie. If they just dropped the word Christians from it. It'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Why are they wasting everybody's time by passing resolutions that make no fucking difference? This doesn't mean anything. No. But somebody sat down and wrote it and ignored passing decent laws in order to get this to pass. Resolutions are a waste of time. Yeah, and the the woman who uh, who proposed this bill, uh, she is from um, northern Idaho, uh, not too far from where I was raised. Oh, okay. Uh, which is... Uh, a pretty conservative area, the the especially the county she's in. Um, but again, while most of them are Christians, they don't care. This is this is her own pet shit. Oh yeah, the people there they did not ask for this. Nope, they do not demand this. They don't care. She this got is, elected for this right, kind of shit. Right, she was probably like a you know, uh, getting money from some church group to. Well, and okay, this is asking for Christians to not be persecuted in places like. China and Nigeria. The Idaho State House of Representatives has zero influence over yeah, China. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's a complete waste of time. Ugh. Yeah, it makes zero sense um, outside of yeah some uh, news media, I guess, maybe trying to get the idea brought into a zeitgeist kind of thing. I, I have no idea what they could possibly gain by they're just that, trying to score political points with a certain special interest, the, the yeah. Christian special interest which, group. Which I don't even, yeah, it's not even their own constituents. It, it's, yeah, it's outside influenced special interests. And uh, the city of <laughs> Boise has set a goal to only use renewable energy by 2040. That's a pretty good goal. Um, pretty lofty, honestly, considering what, where we're at so far, but... Now, at the same time... Uh, I think it's doable here, though. I think so, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, Idaho Power has also set a goal of getting off of coal in the next, like, it was like four or five years. Yeah, it was pretty That's quick. much more impressive to me, because Idaho still does use a lot of coal. Yes. Well, Idaho Power, specifically, right. has one coal plant. They just need to replace the one coal plant. Okay, make it so. And it's probably old and outdated, and they're like, well, you're going to have to do some renovations and repairs, and they're like, or not. It let's, was, let's just not do that. It was funny. It's not even in, in Idaho. That one is in, uh, it's in Nevada. But so this, this proposal is going to include, for, for the city of Boise, is going to include not just the city's owned, city-owned facilities, but the city as a whole. So... It's going to be tied with Idaho Power getting off of coal, but it's also going to require that all of the other energy sources that are getting fed into the city are all renewable. Yeah. And one of the ways they want to try to capitalize on this is by investing in geothermal, which we have a shit ton of. We do. We're actually, so we've got a pretty good area here for renewable energy. There's there's a brand new solar uh, facility between here yep. and Mountain Home that's actually pretty nice. Uh, we oh that's big yeah it, it is and we've got we've got nothing but desert around us right like yep. this is a great area sunny sunny desert. yeah we've got dry you know, it, it's it's a good area for um, geothermal for solar for wind uh, and most of our you know uh, in Idaho uh, uh, in general I think the majority of our power is all um, uh, water so. It, it's I think a slight majority is hydroelectric. Yeah, it's, it's a between Dwarshack and um, yeah, that's a huge uh, northern Idaho amount of power. So um, down here, yeah, it's kind of a, a bit of a mix, but yeah, up north, it's pretty much all. Well, and like, yeah, dams have very detrimental uh, environmental impacts. They do, uh, but there are there is so much hydroelectric power in the region, and has been now granted populations have risen to where that's not sufficient anymore but there is so much hydroelectric power in the region that there's a lot of dams that aren't hydroelectric they're just irrigation or just flood control yeah you're right those are a waste if you're going to do the environmental damage of putting in a dam it better be having some environmental 
benefits as well. Yeah, make it fully worthwhile. And all of the other dams, I wouldn't be surprised if they could do some major renovations because a lot of them are on the verge of collapse. If they upgraded the the turbines, um, I'd be fascinated to know how much of an improvement in efficiencies they could get using modern turbines as opposed to some of these from the 40s and 50s. And I, I know it takes a lot of copper, um, and that's getting spendy these days, but I think we can do a lot better than what we're doing currently. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I am super distracted. I Oh, yeah. This is why I haven't been on for the past couple weeks, because dealing with Kylie is just, I have to keep an eye on her at all times. And that usually involves having my head turned away from the microphone. Because right now she's kneeling on the armrest, getting into Lauren's craft stuff. Which is fine, except the kneeling on the armrest means that she's going to fall backwards at some point. Yep. Ah, this is frustrating. <laughs> I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, exit. <laughs> exit. Okay. And uh, maybe take her for a walk or something, because I'm not, I'm not, pre- not, not helping out too much here. And uh, she looks like she needs a distraction. Although, if if you could stay on for just a couple minutes, we're going to move into the discussion and. I'd be interested in the mom perspective first. Oh, okay. (laughs) So let's talk about what it's like to be an atheist in Idaho. And since Lauren wants to to take Kylie and exit the situation, uh, you've been going to a lot of, of mom and kid events. Have you noticed any issues? Well, as a mom. Yes and no. Um, no, because I go to the public stuff that's free, and those are usually um, government-sponsored, you know, library time, that kind of thing. And that's um, inherently secular, and religion never comes up. Uh, but I am making do because I don't have a church group to help me do daycare, to do Sunday services. Um, even throughout the week, uh, there's... Uh, like young parent groups for the Mormon church that do stuff. I So I, I'm missing out on 80% of what's available and making do with the 20% that I, the, that I do choose to be a part of. Um, Facebook groups are, I've been avoiding them for obvious reasons. Everybody knows about how uh, toxic mom groups are on, on the, on the s- social media. Um, so, as an atheist raising a kid right now, it's not a problem. I am actually pretty happy with it. Okay. My kid is not in school yet, though. And yep. That's that's when things turn. Mm. Um, when a kid starts getting bullied for not going to church, that's that's when anxiety, depression, social anxiety, uh, that's when that all starts to filter through, and we'll have to... Uh, Which, you dealt with that. I dealt with that personally, yeah, so... It's not something I want her to have, but at the same time, I don't want to teach her that there's some invisible boogeyman in the sky either. So you take what you can, what you can live with. Otherwise, she's very happy. Yeah, she loves everybody. All right, if you want to go now. Okay. Go for it. I guess what I'm saying is, you make make it make of it what you what you will. You know, you can either focus on. Uh, the persecution of, of non-believers and their kids, or you just go out and you find stuff that is kid-friendly, which there's so much stuff out there. Yeah. And, and it's nice that, you know, and, and we have this in Boise. I don't know if you'd get much of this outside of Boise. That's true. Okay, yeah, that's true. Because, like, Idaho Falls would have been a little bit different because so much stuff is done by the church. Um, so even, although there would be like a city run Easter egg hunt, for example, well, that's, that's nice. It's tiny. It's overcrowded and there's 15 other way better Easter egg hunts being done in all the churches around you. Yeah. And you really start to feel it when you're more rural. Now, Idaho Falls is still quite a large area relatively I don't know what it's like even in the smaller, smallest communities where city-run 
kid friendly events just don't happen. Yeah. Where the only options are the only options kids. are are whatever there the ward is doing or whatever yeah. your Catholic church is is doing. So well, and one of the things that, that people often assume about Idaho is that oh it's just a bunch of Mormons. That's southern Idaho. Yeah, almost exclusively. Yeah. That's almost and especially yeah. southeastern Idaho. Southeastern yeah. Idaho is just northern Utah. <laughs> The more west you go, the less Mormon influence there is. Uh, Meridian has a booming Mormon population right now, so the Treasure Valley does have a decent amount of it, but in the Treasure Valley, it tends to actually still be more Catholics and Pentecostals dominating things than Mormons. Yeah. Which is what you find in the rest of the state is Catholics and Pentecostals. Yeah, and I can tell you from a very small town perspective in, in northern Idaho, um, we just didn't have those things. Yeah. Uh, they weren't city run. They weren't church run. They just didn't exist. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, there, there were just no kid things. Uh, uh, s- some of the smaller areas, uh, there were farming communities that were kind of based around the church. Uh, they might do some of those things, but it'd be like 15 people, you know, really, really, really small. Uh, and no other options, really. That, that was, that was, there, was, there wasn't even like a city to be had in those areas. The church was kind of the city in those very, very small farming communities, but... Yeah, for the most part, we just didn't do things for kids. Lauren, you've been great. Thank you. So, Gary, what, what's what's your experience personally been? Uh, mine's been mostly positive, I'd say, especially in the last couple few years. Um, the uh, the early days, so I, I feel like there's been a lot of social change that, that makes it easier, right? Um, where we were either unknown or just feared. Um, it, the, the A word. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the society has, has moved at least locally, um, toward a, um, a much more understanding, you know, uh, feeling about atheists. Uh, they either don't know or don't care or they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, I, I think the, um, uh, media has helped a little bit. Um, there's been plenty of, of atheist related stuff mm-hmm. in everything, right? Yeah. Uh, which has been great. Yeah, you know, um, we did a billboard. We did Fourth of July for five years until people stopped booing. Yeah, right. Yeah, it took it took a little bit, but yeah, it was fun once we did. Um, and I think, um, yeah, people overall have um, banded together uh, thanks to the group, and I, I they don't feel so alone. So I think it's talked about a bit more. And you know, Boise's not a super large area. Uh, word of mouth gets around pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a funny thing that happened. I don't know, probably about a month ago. Uh, there's a, there's a very small, uh, um, it's a dive bar, not too far. It's on the bench here. It's called little Dutch garden. Um, it's just a beer bar, but it's like a working man's bar. Okay. Um, very, everything's very working class there. Um, uh, most of the, um, the, the people there are actually older. Uh, so it's like a few younger guys here once in a while, but there's regulars that come in, you know, for like at 4 PM every day. Um, some of them just got off work. Some of them are retired and just come in. Uh, but it's it's a it's definitely divey place and very like I say working man's kind of place. I had only been there like once or twice, and I met this guy, chatted with him a little bit, and I talked about you know atheism. It just came up, and um, the next time I was in there, um, there was a pretty full crowd around the bar, and he was there, and he's like, "I forget your name." He's like atheist. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, that's me." And another guy piped up like, "Hey, I'm an atheist." <laughs> and then two more piped up. Yeah, yeah, me too. And like the other guy says, like, yeah, former Catholic here. There's eight people around this twelve person bar that all <laughs> admitted to be an atheist. And like, yeah. that is fucking wild. Uh, I don't think that's ever happened to me before. You know, the, just randomly like that. Uh, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, completely atheist. Huh. One, one of which had a goat, so it was even funnier that he <laughs> a goat in a bar. On top of that, but yeah, it was funny that he was an atheist with the the whole goat thing. And yeah, you know and. I, what I've definitely seen is there's really three categories when you look at what it's like in Idaho. There is Idaho, there's the Treasure Valley, and then there's Boise. Yeah, that's true. And if you're in Boise, nobody gives a shit. Not really. No. Not anymore. And some of that was is just the fact that Boise's a, a pretty liberal city with a the demographics are actually pretty favorable like a quarter or more of the people in Boise are okay a quarter of the people in Idaho do not identify with religion right 
in Boise, that number's probably up closer to 30 or 40 percent. Yeah, if not even a little higher than that even, but yeah, it's... And so in Boise, everything is fine. Uh, and I also think a big part of it is what the atheist community here has done with the billboard, the parades, and the like. We got out there in the open. We got in... I'm not going to say in people's faces, but we got in front of their eyes. Yeah. And by people knowing that we're there has removed the stigma. Yeah, I think so. And I, um, yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, Mikey Pullman's Atheist Comedy Mm -hmm. Show, which is a huge, huge draw. Uh, And the amount of people that come to it, um, like they're, even if they just follow the comics and are not atheists, uh, they're introduced to a, you know, a pretty impressive amount of atheist material. Yeah. Uh, whether it's funny, honest, whatever. Um, and it's it's pretty heavily advertised. Um, yeah. It's, it's a pretty big thing, and he's done a great job. Like, I, um, because it is a mainstream event, um, it catered to a small amount of people, it's become mainstream uh, thanks to that. So yeah. Yeah. I think he's done a great job with that alone in, in helping. Yeah, after the first couple sold-out shows. Yeah. It became multiple shows over several days or several shows in the same night or both. Yeah, it was pretty big. And the the he sold out the VAC last time. Yeah. And that is a large venue for, for Boise. Um, I don't know. It's, it's probably like uh, almost 200 some odd yeah. seats in there. And you know, it's, it's not a super cheap um, arena either. Like most of the, like the comedy clubs are like five bucks. You know, this is like 15, 20 bucks a pop. Pretty big thing. And he sold it, sold it out. Um, had a great amount of uh, of uh, uh, comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, they always just perform so well, and yeah. uh, again, super popular. Even if people are um, not atheists, I think they understand the comedy of it, mm-hmm. and it's really made everything pretty mainstream because of that. Yeah, well, and also looking at the comedy scene, it's my assumption would be probably half of the comics in Boise are atheists, and they get jabs at religion into a lot of their sh- their their shows. Regular shows, yeah. The regular shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm going to say it's probably higher than that. It's I think it's actually hard to be a comic and a a uh, believer. <laughs> like when you, when your job is to break down absurd things to mm-hmm. to make comedy, religion's going to be one of the first ones. Uh it's it's hard to keep that uh that idea, I think when you start breaking things down in your brain all the time. Um so I I, I think a pretty good chunk of our of our comics in comics in general are atheists. Like it's it's just yeah. hard, um, but a lot of them aren't um, identified by it. It's just you know mm-hmm. I I think religion's kind of stupid kind of thing. But I think uh, Mikey has actually kind of given this um, this platform to some of those jokes on the regular, and and I, I think they usually win pretty. W- especially we're sur- surrounded by Mormons, right? So yeah. Um, even in Boise, if we're not directly, um, you know, affected or persecuted, uh, a lot of our outlying areas are yeah. like the people who wear, uh, Idaho atheist shirts, um, going to Meridian is far worse than going to Caldwell for them. Like the stairs they get, the jeers, uh, Meridian, all the Mormons there are way yep. worse than even like the super religious folks in Caldwell. Um, and that it's kind of says something about you know the Mormon culture you know in in Meridian I think they they want inclusion and mm-hmm. um, for their own type and exclusion for everyone else they don't right. they don't want to be and, introduced to anything that's not them and Meridian at least certain parts of it are basically a Mormon colony in the Boise area yeah uh, it's it's kind of creepy it's enough that there are enough Mormons in Meridian. That they built a temple north of town. Yeah. It's a lot of Mormons to make a temple like that. It's a whole lot, yeah. Uh, especially when there's already a temple in Boise. Right. And it just wasn't enough. And it's and, not very far. It's like 20 minutes, you know. It's, yeah. If even that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's nuts. Uh, then there's, okay, there's Nampa, which has a God and Country Festival every year. Right. And the city council try seems to be actively trying to make sure atheists stay in Boise. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Although um, April did go out to the God and Country Festival to get signatures um, to repeal 
um, the actually it was um, to add the amendment to repeal the um, religious exclusion for for uh, child neglect. Okay. Um, so she was out there getting signatures for that, and she did pretty well. Um, now that's something that most Christians can agree with too. I, I think so too. It's it was funny that uh, anything outside like you know worshiping guns, God, because mm-hmm. um, that's not really part of either. Uh, the people were on board. Like they, they, I, I wouldn't think they would give it much attention. But she did okay. She, I think she got, um, I don't know, almost a hundred some odd signatures. Oh, out nice. There, which is not bad. Um, and you know, she didn't get too many, you know, negative comments or anything. Um, and, and this is in a, an area like it's right close to where the mm-hmm. the the church um is you know located. So like, which was right there in Caldwell. So um, I, uh, Melba. Oh, is it Melba? I thought it was right outside of Caldwell. Oh, is it further? It's. I think it's on the other side. No, it's it's down oh, south. Okay. Yeah. So you head out towards Caldwell and then turn south. Okay. All right. Yeah, I've actually been up that road a few times. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. notice that's where it was. Um. So yeah, she did okay there, but Nampa itself. I mean, even Nampa's uh, city seal is very Mormon. Um. It's got <laughs> um. It's got a, a man and woman. Uh, I think she's holding a baby. There is a, a Mormon temple spire behind them, um, like a, a field on one side, and I forget what's on the other side, and then like a, um, I think a, a, um, a collegiate hat to, for the NNU. I, I think that's, that's the entire seal, but it's oh. super Mormon, very white. Like these are the whitest people you ever see on any city seal, no <laughs> color whatsoever. Um, and yeah, it's... It's not exactly uh, uh, inclusive to everyone. Now, say. the city government itself tends to go more towards Pentecostal. They do, yeah, with, oddly. Yeah. Well, it's not that seal. odd, it's, well, yeah. but uh, Northwest Nazarene University is right there in Napa. Right, yeah. Considering the seal is so Mormon, yeah. uh, I, I find that kind of surprising. Yeah, I um, I don't know if the demographics have changed since that seal was introduced, or probably, or, or if there was just like a Mormon majority on the board at the time. I Yeah. Yeah. And, and Napa has, uh, going kind of a, a against being a favorable to a favorable place for atheists. You've got both in and you and the Adventist church's Pacific press. Yeah. Which right. when Pacific press moved their their entire staff from mountain view, California packed up and moved to Nampa and increased the number of Adventists in that area significantly. <laughs> yeah, I bet it did. Yeah. We actually do some work for, for pack press at, at my job. Um, some of the off, uh, overflow printing stuff. Okay. Yeah. I get to see their seal a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that crazy little flame. Yeah. And then, you know, Caldwell is at this point, I think mostly Mexican. Yeah. I would say that's and, pretty, and I, Latin American. Yeah. Uh, pretty heavily Catholic. Yes. Also pretty heavily Pentecostal. Yeah. Especially toward the outskirts of town. I mean, the center of town is not very big, so it's a lot of outskirts. Right. But, um, I think, um, so both Nampa and Caldwell are working to make a downtown. Uh, yep. they're spending a lot of money on it. Um, so is Meridian. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. Meridian yeah. is too. Uh, I think Meridian's gonna, you know, just toss money into it and not have any culture, which is kind of the Meridian way. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I hope that, uh, like Caldwell makes their culture around the Latino uh, community. Uh, I think it'd be a much, much stronger downtown if they did. Oh Yeah. Definitely. It's, it's such a, it should be a strong identity, but I know it's also, you know, very whitewashed in the city council, but. Right. Because the city council represents those who have money. Exactly. And the moneyed interests there are in a lot of cases, long-term families that yeah. have been there for, you know, heck I had, I had family there from off and on between like 1895 and 1910 and then solidly from 1910 to 1995 wow that's a that's a long time i would not be surprised if the city council had third or fourth generation family members on yeah on the council whereas a a significant portion of the hispanic population there is migrant farm workers right uh immigrants and it's you're you're gonna run into a lot more people there who can't vote yeah, honestly. Either true. can't or just don't vote. Right. Yeah. And that will definitely skew the uh the demographics in the the city government. But it's 
still, like like you've you've mentioned, you're gonna get fewer dirty looks there than you are in Meridian. Right. Yeah, they just care more in Meridian, I think, about who you are. Um, I, it might be the fact that they're so close to Boise that they feel mm-hmm. some culture uh, clash uh, where Caldwell probably doesn't. Like, you know, we can do whatever the hell we want to out here. We're Caldwell. Um, where Meridian, you know, they probably get some pushback from their lack of inclusion, uh, lack of color. Like, Meridian is probably one oh, of yeah. the whitest places I've ever been to, and I've lived oh, yeah. in Idaho my entire <laughs> life. Um, it, it's it's super, super damn white. Um, and and again, kind of devoid of, of culture in general. Uh, even it's a our, suburb. Yeah, it pretty much is. It's a, it's a large, pretty wealthy, um, heavily tax-paying suburb. Uh, and, and these are the people that gave a ton of money to Romney's wife when she when she showed up um, the uh, the last election Romney was in, which okay. I forget what year that was, but um, yeah, twenty twelve. Yeah, twenty twelve. Yeah, uh, it, I think she got um, half a million dollars oh, uh, wow. in donations from from just Meridian alone, which is you know Meridian's not a ton of t- people that are like super active, so wow. half a million dollars in one fundraiser uh, is kind of substantial for somebody that I don't think they're even that crazy about. I mean, I know he's their Mormon, you know, representative, but I don't think they even really liked him all that much. Yeah, yeah. even though he is Mormon. Wow. And yeah. It was just his wife, you know, not not Romney himself. That. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think that she did a ton of fundraising. So the fact that the she showed up and they gave so much money was kind of telling, I think. All right, and uh, what would you say would be the general feel you get from? Uh, the the members in in Idaho atheists and and what you see on the the Facebook page, do you think people have it generally pretty well? I think so. I, I think locally at least, yeah. Um, uh, to uh, Lauren's point earlier, the people that have kids have it far worse. I think, um, especially if you're needing daycare uh, help, support things like that. Um, and that's one of the hardest things. Like it's it would be a great thing for us to be able to contribute. And have kid friendly stuff, but it takes so much time and energy for kid friendly stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it really a, a lot of time and energy, and people have tried, uh, but usually it takes so much you have to peter right. out. Well, and the adult events and the kid friendly events generally need to be separate. Yeah, they appeal to different groups. Usually, yeah. And parents are going to be the best people at setting up kid friendly events. Definitely. And parents have the least time to set up kid friendly events. Right. Yeah, and they've already got a lot on their plate. Um, and they're usually the ones that want it the most, so they're they're going to be the ones to try to volunteer. But yeah, it's uh, it, it takes so much that yeah, you've got to peter out pretty quickly. It's hard to maintain, um, and it's hard to get like a ton of people on board at once. Because mm-hmm. um, I think they're all I don't think there's that many people that don't have you know multiple working households. Um, this is Idaho after all. Like it's it's kind of rare for for not to be like a dual income household. Um, so or or single parents on top of that. So it's. Uh, that's even harder, right? The less time, uh, fewer resources. Um, but the churches do usually do have a lot of time for that. Yeah. You've got people who are paid just to do those kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, volunteer versus paid is a whole different ballgame. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they seem to be pretty good at it. Yeah, I'm not going to make any qualms about that. The churches are pretty good about getting families involved. Oh, yeah. It makes complete sense why they would. Yep. Um, but yeah, they're pretty good at it. That's I think it's their bread and butter, right? Well, churches bank on like the way they survive is because it's it's basically guaranteed that teenagers and young adults are gonna leave. The hope to keep a church alive is that when they have kids, they'll come back. Right. Yeah. And so if you create a strong enough incentive for people to come back when they have kids the life of the church will continue. Yeah, it's true. And I've seen the pressure that Mormons put on people once they have kids. Uh, once they get married, and then once they have kids, uh, two different events usually, mm-hmm. sometimes at the same time, but um, the pressure is insane that Mormons apply to people uh, in that situation. Uh, the families come out in droves, and uh, they start offering monetary rewards. Um, yeah. I'll, you know, I'll put a down payment on a house, you know, buy you cars, things like that. Uh, when the resources are available and it's to kind of get you back in yep. into the, these graces and a little bit of, you know, you're beholden to the people. Well, and, and the, also the, the Mormons definitely push, get married young, start having babies immediately, have yeah. lots of babies, stay dependent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't, uh, you can't really venture out on your own completely. And if you end up getting your job from somebody in the, in the ward and your next job is also from somebody in the ward and then you move, 
because you got a job from somebody in the church and all of your social friends are all in the ward. How do you, 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 it's almost impossible to leave that. Yeah. When I see people that do go through the process of leaving, I have the utmost respect like that. The way their lives are usually revolved around the church um, in every possible facet. Uh, I don't know that I would be brave enough to leave that. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I might lie for a while. I don't know. Um, and when they, when they have to face that and when they, they feel they, they can't do anything but face that and, and do make the choice to leave, they usually have to leave everything. It is a brand new life that they're, that they're leading at that point. And that takes some serious strength. And yeah. So anytime somebody leaves a church like that, I, I am super impressed. Oh I yeah. No idea how a lot of them do it. Yeah. Um, but so I've lived in, with the exception of one year I spent at the Seventh Avenue Theological Seminary at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Uh, I have spent my entire life in the Northwest, pretty decently split between Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. And what I would say is the big difference I've seen is here the perception is different. The actual day to day experience isn't. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. You're not treated in most places, nobody cares. Okay. And now, granted, if you move into the wrong neighborhood, you're going to run into issues, but it's most likely nobody's going to care if you're an atheist or not. But the political power that religious interests have here is strong enough that people feel the need to find that that group. Yeah, uh, the, the political power is always disproportionate, right? Whenever you're not like a city-based uh, area or uh, state, and, uh, you know, Boise's not big enough yet to pull that much political power. Um, uh, Salt Lake City is close in Utah to pulling mm-hmm. way more political power than the rest of the state. And so their their, govern- their governance is changing. Oh, yeah. Um, and I... Idaho probably won't change until that happens if if Boise grows large enough. Um, you know, but, you, like you look at Oregon. Portland is, the Portland metropolitan area is a majority of the state population. Yeah. Flat out. And the rest is super conservative, but it doesn't yeah. really matter that much because Portland has so much power. And in, in Washington, the Puget Sound is a majority of the state population. Yeah. And same, same exact same thing. Yeah. Um, there are pockets of um, progressive areas in Washington, but pretty much the entire uh, eastern Washington, super conservative, almost yeah. as conservative as you get. Um, the Even my parts of northern Idaho uh, were much less religious than the eastern Washington, right across the border you know, oh, yeah. in some cases, um, like uh, uh, Colfax and some of those smaller towns, super religious and very conservative, uh, where a, a lot of the Idaho cities were right next door. It was more of a, we don't really give a fuck. Right, like I, I drove around for quite a while with a Darwin Fish magnet on the back of my car. And the reason why it was for quite a while was eventually it fell off. Nobody swiped it, but a bumpy dirt road getting to a primitive camp outside of Stanley, mm. it fell off. Yeah, that's not bad. That's pretty yeah. telling. Like, uh, I, and, and we get out. <laughs> We get out into the small towns, out into the rural yeah, areas, do. and nobody gives a shit. There was a member, um, I think she had a uh, like a pro-choice bumper sticker um, at the hospital at St. Luke's, the larger hospital. I, I think it's larger. She did have somebody scratch through it on oh. her car uh, in the parking lot. Um, so that's you know kind of rare. Uh, I'm going to guess that you know, anybody can come to the hospital from the area, of course. Um, but employee parking is usually places that only employees park. Yeah, right, right. So uh, it was it, that was kind of surprising to hear, but uh, that's the, and that was only like last year. So um, not unheard of, of course, but for the most part, I think everyone gets gets away pretty easy on on identifying. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the Darwin fish, um, you know, my favorite is the T-Rex eating the, the, the fish. Um, the... Um, uh, equality signs are on a, a chunk of cars, oh, which yeah. is nice. Um, and no one seems to really mess with those. Yeah. And, and it's, when you, you look at the hospitals, things are different. They are. Yeah. But that's true anywhere. And especially when it comes to kids in hospitals and, and you know, St. Luke's has a large maternity ward, right? So you're going to have people that are there, you know, 
for the baby. Everything's for, mm-hmm. for babies, right? Um, so they're probably going to be some very conservative yeah. people that, that work in or visit the, the maternity ward. And St. Al's has crosses everywhere. Yeah. Because yeah, they're they, Catholic. Right. Yeah. Yes, they do. And they want to make sure you know they're Catholic. Very much so. Yeah. But more on that on a future date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there'll be plenty of talk on that. <laughs> uh, all right, so I think uh, we've we've pretty well covered that topic. This was something that somebody requested on the the survey. Oh, so okay, nice. Uh, it's been in the back of my head to talk about this. We had a, you know, threw the episode together. And I threw it together uh, two hours before we started recording. Oh, not bad. So yeah, yeah, that was that was helpful. Um, Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It was good to be here. Uh, listeners, if you want to help support the show, you can go to atheistnomads.com slash donate to find out all the ways how. And uh, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads. Atheist Nomads.